It's the month of May, and in the world of pro cycling, that means one thing. The toughest race in the world's most beautiful place, as RCS Sport like to call it. It's the first Grand Tour of the year, the Giro d'Italia. So get ready to lock yourselves in for three weeks of thrilling action, mountains, gravel, a healthy dose of adrenaline and emotion, plus more coverage than you can shake a stick at. That's right. This is going to be massive for us here at GCN Plus because for the first time ever, we have exclusive rights to the Giro d'Italia in both the USA and Canada, and it's available in all GCN Plus territories except for Latin America and New Zealand. So almost all of you will be able to join us, and we very much hope you will. Indeed. Happy days. We will have all 21 stages live and on demand, all of which, in fact, are live right from kilometre zero. Plus, we've got short and long form highlights if you don't have quite so much time. And all of them have the option of seven different languages. Great stuff. Uh, plus, we're going to have live pre and post race analysis shows with a whole host of special guests, written previews, live updates, maps and profiles, results, start line interviews, and loads of interactive polls and quizzes so that you can get involved with both your opinions and indeed testing your knowledge as well. It's going to be a busy old month. But I honestly cannot wait for Saturday. No, to get you all up to speed on what to expect now, though, coming up, we'll be going through the key stages and the riders to watch out for, including the return of both Remco Evenepoel and Dylan Groenewegen. So get your diaries out, because you are definitely going to want to block out a few days within it. I think you should just block out the entire month, to be yeah. honest, because we've also got the world of cycling coming out on the rest days this year, haven't yeah. we? So that you don't have those days where you don't know what to do with yourselves because there's no racing on. <laughs> uh, right, let's get on with the preview then. This year's edition is the 104th of the race, and it began all the way back in 1909. Uh, this year, they'll be covering a total of 3,480 kilometers over the course of those 21 stages. Which are divided up as follows. Two time trials, eight days in the mountains, an additional six hilly days, and only five flat days, which as ever, can be taken with a pinch of salt when it comes to Giro d'Italia, because more often than not, even the flat days aren't as simple as the sprinters would hope. No. So it all kicks off in Torino, or Turin, this coming Saturday, the 8th of May, with a flat 9K opening time trial that will decide the first pink jersey wearer and establish an early hierarchy on the general classification. From there, the sprinters get their first opportunity on stage two, and then we're already into the hills on stage three to Canale. Yeah, it's the following day, though, where we already have the first summit finish. Well, near ours, damn it, anyway, right near the end of the 187 kilometer stage. They will climb the Colle Passerino, just over four kilometers long, with an average gradient of 10% and a section of 16%, before then an undulating two and a half k's to the line in Sestola, which sounds fantastic. It does sound brilliant, doesn't it? That's on the Tuesday. And from there, we've got a flat and almost arrow straight stage that will take the race down to the Adriatic coast and a finish in Catolica. And then it's on to the first of the true summit finishes. Stage six from Grotti di Frassasi, home to one of the largest cave networks in Europe, apparently. Great Grossi fact. meaning caves in Italian. Uh, that goes to Ascoli Piceno. And then there's the climb of the San Giacomo, only used once before in the race, all the way back in 2002. Really? Mm. It's 15 and a half kilometers at 6%, although that only warrants second category climb status in the Giro <laughs> d'Italia, which is brutal. Uh, but anyway, it will be another indication of who's hot and who's not among the GC contenders. There will be 3,400 metres of climbing over 160 kilometres. That's going to be a tough one, you'd have thought. Uh, stage seven should be another one for the sprinters as any deviations from the coastal road come early in the day. And then it's yet another uphill finish on stage eight, this time to Guardia San Framondi. Uh, but it's Sunday the 16th of May, which is the first date to get etched into your diaries. That's right, 160 k's with barely a metre of flat. There are four categorised climbs and a further two which look like they should be categorised but aren't. Finishes on the first category at Rocca de Cambio at the ski station of Campo Felice with the final slopes on double digit gradients and gravel. Happy days. Yes. I mean, there's always that debate, isn't there, as to whether gravel sections belong in a Grand Tour. But I think pretty much all of us look forward to those days. Yeah. So perhaps that's the conclusion of any debate then. Uh, the following day looks to be for the sprinters despite a couple of lumps and bumps along the way. And then the Ryans will finally get a well-earned rest day on Tuesday the 18th of May. Yeah, and they will hope to get a good rest as well because the following day marks the next date for your diaries. Wednesday the 19th of May is the Giro d'Italia's nod to Strada Bianca on a 162 kilometer stage to Montalcino. Which some of you will remember because that is where Cadell Evans took that epic 
plastic stage win over gravel roads that had turned into more like muddy rivers. I remember it well. Early on the day, didn't it? It's a day actually I remember quite well because I was dropped before we even got to any of the gravel <laughs> roads on that particular stage. But at least on this occasion, I'll get to see what's happening at the front of the race. <laughs> Yeah, no KOMs for you on the gravel that day. Not on that don't. particular day, so I know. No, just Strada Bianca, where you got the KOM. Yeah, that's yeah, the one. Just Strada Bianca, yeah. Uh, anyway, on this year's gravel stage, we have a total of 35 kilometres of Storati, which is over twice what there were in 2010. This time it's over four sectors, the longest of which is really very long at 13 and a half kilometres, and the last of which leads them straight into a climb of the Paso del Lumo Spento, which literally translates into, you'll be completely spent after this stage. <laughs> I thought you were gonna actually give us a literal translation then. Oh, that is, I'm pretty no, sure. Isn't. It isn't. Uh, particularly though, it's going to be hard because this is also the wine stage of ah, this year's Tough for us at home, you mean? It is, yeah. A lot to look forward to, I think, on that Indeed, particular yeah. day. But we better move on because we're only just over halfway through the route at this point. Now, one day that you don't potentially need in your diaries, unless the wind is blowing from the right direction, is Friday the 21st of May. So I guess check the wind forecast on Thursday the 20th. Yeah, put a calendar note in on the Thursday night then. <laughs> yeah, uh, It really couldn't be any flatter on that particular day. 198 kilometers to Verona, so maybe just tune in for the final part. Uh, but the rest could serve you well because the next date for your diaries comes the very following day. It does, Saturday the 22nd of May, a 205 kilometer long stage, which finishes atop the mighty Monte Zonkalan. Last year's in 2018, where Chris Froome won, this is widely regarded as one of the toughest tests in the world of professional cycling. 14 Ks long, 8.5% average, but the last three of those average 13%, and the maximum gradient is 27%. I'm sure that gets more every year. Yeah. Are they making it steeper somehow? <laughs> it's more like rock climbing, really. It is, yeah. Gradients, isn't it? Uh, do not miss that one, though. I cannot wait for it. No. Uh, Heli Day follows that one, and it's time for the Queen stage of this year's race after that on some roads we know very well, Sign, in Alta Badia region. We do indeed, yeah. The Cortina d'Ampezzo stage, 212 kilometres with 5,700 metres of climbing. And yes, you did hear that right, 5,700 metres. It is, as you would expect, another date to firmly mark in your diaries. So Monday the 24th of May. Nasty, I think, is how I would describe that particular mm, stage. Because they apt. start at just 30 metres above sea level. They then take on the first category climb of La Crosetta soon after the start. And then they will take on three climbs in the second half of that stage, which all peak at over 2,000 metres above sea level. We have the Paso Fedaya, the Paso Pordoi, and the Paso Jao for a fast ascent to that finish line in Cortina d'Ampezzo. Yeah, the Jao is very hard. I'm not going to lie, 10 k's at 9%. So if you've got bad legs that day, you are going to pay for it. But another well-earned rest day, very well-earned really, isn't it? It comes the day after that, and then it's on to the traditionally brutal final few days. Hooray! Stage 17 has, <laughs> has a summit finish never used before at the Giro d'Italia, the Sega di Alla, 11.5 kilometers at an average of 9.5%, so even harder than the Jow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the only respite, in fact, over those final few days is stage 18, which would be a sprinter stage, except for the fact that they've lumped all the lumps into the closing kilometres, <laughs> so possibly a day for the breakaway, I guess. Uh, stage 19 is another summit finish, this time on the Alpa di Mera, 9.7 k's at 9%, and another new entry for the Giro d'Italia. And then take a look at this profile for stage 20. Blimey! How long is that, final, that first climb? Well, I can tell you, Si. It's 24 kilometers long, <laughs> with an average gradient of 6.2%, including a small descent in the middle of the climb. Huh. Uh, it's the Paso San Bernardino and the final day for your diary, Saturday the 29th of May. 4,200 meters of climbing, almost all of it coming in the second half of that stage and finishing atop the Alpe Motta after a brief excursion into Switzerland. 7.3 k's long, that final climb at 7.6%, but the steepest gradients come near the very end. Yeah, after that, it's a simple matter of a 30 kilometer long flat time trial into Milan for the final day. Although, the Giro does seem to have a knack of only settling the GC on the final stage time trial, just like it did last year, in mm. fact. So here is hoping that that's the case again this year. Whew. Right, that is the route. So let's get on to the riders to watch out for this year. And we will start with the riders who will be hoping to wear pink after that final time trial. In Remco Avenepoel. Well, hang on a minute, <laughs> hold your horses. I know you're excited <laughs> about this, very excited. But the big favourite for the overall win, I think, it's got to be Agam Bernal. Oh, does it? 
really. I mean, he's yet to win a race since those back problems started plaguing him at the Tour de France last year. And we have heard him say that he is still having to deal with these, those problems on a daily basis. Mm. Well, that is true, but there have also been glimmers of hope for him, haven't there? Uh, the Tour de la Provence, fourth uh, at Torino, third at Strada Bianca. So we'll know that he'll be all right on the mm. gravel. The signs aren't too bad there, are they? But I do know what you mean. The physical pressure of a three-week Grand Tour is something else. Um, and this will actually be the only Grand Tour he's ridden outside of the Tour de France. Yeah, I guess that's right. But then he's no stranger to success in Italian races, is he? That is also correct. Well, let's hope he is on top of form because yep. that really would create some big excitement in the high mountains. And they have some great support there from his team, Ineos Grenadiers, of course. Castrovieco, Martinez, Sosa and Sivakov amongst their lineup. Uh, another rider, though, who'll be looking forward to the high mountains is Simon Yates, who, as we all know, has unfinished business at the Giro d'Italia mm. already three years ago. Uh, now, since he crumbled after that stage 18 epic, uh, losing what looked to be a cast iron grip on the pink jersey, and eventually, slipping outside the top 10 on GC. Yeah, I don't think any of us will ever forget that stage, particularly given Froomey's exploits on the same day. But there is no doubt that Yates learned a lot from that experience. Possibly one of the most epic explosions of all time in cycling, it was. wasn't it? It was very unexpected as well, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Anyway, he is going well now. He looked great en route to victory at the Tour of the Alps, and he'll have taken confidence from that race in the fact that his team rode so well too. Next up. Even a pool? <laughs> Not yet. Jai Hindley. Yeah, fair enough. I guess he was runner up last year behind Terry Gegenhart, uh, who's not going to be defending his title this year. But Hindley is back uh, for Team DSM, but it's going to be tough for him to equal or indeed better his performance of last year. Yeah, unless his performance is judged on his ability to put a rain jacket on. <laughs> uh, then that seems like an easy win. Very true. Uh, now, his early season wasn't particularly spectacular, but he was looking a bit better at Tour the Alps until. He crashed out. He yeah, did, he yeah. crashed out on stage four, and although he finished, he and his team decided it was better not to start the fifth and final stage. So we'll wait and see if that has had a detrimental effect on his preparation. Mm. Do you think he's been practicing putting rain jackets on? I'd have thought so. You would, I wouldn't think you? he sold that one for, um, for charity, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, it was a nice, Brilliant. nice work. Uh, meanwhile, Mikel Lander will lead Bahrain victorious. He's been solid so far this season, if not spectacular. Third at Torino, eighth at the Tour of the Basque Country. But it's the bigger climbs of the Giro Italia that are more his thing, I think. And he'll have a strong team, which includes Pelo Bilbao for backup. Yeah, backup slash nudging him for leadership duties, you think? Potentially, with the way he's been going as well. We'll yeah. see. Spur on uh, Lander, wouldn't it? Anyway, uh, Alexander Vlasov came into this race as a good outside bet last year, but he did succumb to illness in the first week. His form so far this year hasn't been quite as good, but then again, he was the only rider who could keep up with Yates on the fourth stage of the Tour of the Alps. So he's definitely there or thereabouts, isn't he? And I wouldn't be surprised to see him threaten for the final podium. No, I'd go along with that. Uh, another rider who was seriously impressive at the Giro d'Italia last year was the Portuguese rider Joao Almeida, who held onto the pink jersey for what seemed like an eternity, yeah. didn't it? Only to lose it on the penultimate mountain stage. In fact, he's worn that pink jersey for more days than both Naira Quintana and Richard Carapaz, former winners of this race, of course. That is a great fact, Dan. Yeah. Clearly not one of yours. Um, can he back it up, though? His fourth place overall from last year. He's certainly been consistent already in 2021. Third at the UAE Tour, sixth at Torino, and seventh in Catalonia. But he and an informed Fausto Masnada well, will he have to work for Remco Evenepoel? Yes, finally. Yeah, or will they? I mean, it seems very unlikely, doesn't it, given his lack of racing, but then this is Evenepoel we are finally talking about. Pretty much everything he does seems unlikely. True. Last year, he was unbeaten in stage races, taking four from four, and then he had that horrific crash where he ended up at the bottom of a ravine in the Tour of Lombardy. He hasn't raced since, and he's making his return here at the Giro, which will be his first ever Grand Tour. It's quite an unconventional comeback, isn't it? It is. I don't remember anyone who started their season at a Grand Tour. I'm sure it's happened. Well, not, not their recent. first Grand Tour, anyway. No. No, I wouldn't have thought so. Uh, anyway, like you, I wouldn't bet against Remco in any situation. But no. I don't think any of us, not even him, really know what he's capable of over the course of those three weeks in Italy. But one thing we do know is there's going to be an awful lot of attention on yeah. him, isn't there? Yeah, all right, moving on. Remco Avedepoel. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough now. Hugh Carthy, 
third at La Vuelta last year, the harder the better for Carthy, and it doesn't get much harder than the Giro d'Italia. Again, he's another rider he's yet to win so far this year, but he was eighth in Catalonia, 12th in the Basque Country, fifth in the Alps, so he's there or thereabouts, and is another rider who should get better as the race Normally goes on. Normally does, doesn't he? I also proved, of course, at La Vuelta last year that the time trial is not a weakness, didn't he? So he's definitely one to watch at the Giro with those two time trials. Well, we're a long way through this, and we've yet to mention the only former winner who's going to be there this year, Vincenzo Nibli of Trek Segafredo. Yeah, and the reason for that is a training crash from a couple of weeks ago, which left him with a broken wrist and some enforced rest. So given that, it's kind of hard to see him fighting for the win, in my opinion. Mm. Uh, even if I would like to be proven wrong, as I have done <laughs> yes, in the past has, by Vincenzo Nibli. In the past. That was seven years ago now, so I'm 2014 at the Tour, wasn't Yeah, I, I said that Vincenzo would not make the podium and he went on <laughs> to win. Vincenzo Nibli is not going to make the podium. Well, predictions don't come much bolder than that. Really kind of sticking your neck out for want of a better expression. But anyway, uh, Trek Segafredo also have Bauke Mollema though, uh, but we understand that he was originally here to support Nibali and go for stage wins. So we'll soon see if that changes, We will I guess. see, yes. Uh, other GC riders of note include Roman Bardet, now a teammate of Jai Hindley, of course, uh, runner up last year. Dan Martin, who looked good at the Tour of the Alps. He'll lead the Israel startup nation. George Bennett, who'll lead Jumbo Visma. Mark Soler, who'll do the same for Mobistar. And young Jefferson Cepeda, who was very impressive at the recent Tour of the Alps, best young rider. And he was wasn't expecting to be here until Androni Giacatli were given a last minute entry. Yeah, they've also got the youngest rider in the race if he starts. That's 18 year old Andre Ponomar. And don't forget Emmanuel Buchmann as well, who will also lead Bora Hansgrohe's GC hopes. A rider who finished fourth at the Tour just under two years ago. So if he's on that kind of form, he's going to be a real threat for the podium. But star attraction on that team anyway. It's going to be Peter Sagan. Yeah. He'd never actually ridden a race before last autumn, had he? But now he's going to ride it in the space of eight months twice. Yeah. Uh, his only win last season, in fact, came at the Giro d'Italia, and it was vintage Sagan, really, wasn't it? He rode everybody from the breakaway off his wheel, and despite the efforts of the GC riders behind him, he never got caught. It was just brutally strong that yeah. particular day. Uh, Covid delayed the start of his season this year, but he's already got two wins under his belt. Most recently, uh, the first stage on the road at the Tour de Romandie. Yeah, well, as a man who can do it all, Sagan leads us nicely onto the sprinters. And I think everyone's eyes are going to be firmly on Dylan Groenewegen. You remember, you can't possibly not remember that incident at the Tour of Poland last year. And the Dutchman hasn't raced since. His UCI ban from competition ends just before the start of the Giro. But I think we were all still surprised to see his team include him in their roster, as his original programme included mainly smaller races. Yeah, it was a bit of a surprise. And I guess the second guy on the start line that is starting his season at a Grand Tour. Yeah. But his participation is going to be interesting on so many different levels, isn't it? Firstly, I guess, how is his form? Secondly, how does he cope with being back in the bunch? And thirdly, how does the rest of the peloton, and in particular the Koenig Quickstep, react to his return? Yeah, Evenepoel insinuated that he would not be made to feel welcome in the peloton. And I guess you can understand that lingering anger after what he did, but at the same time, he has apologised profusely. Yeah. Uh, he served his suspension. And he's suffered a lot, actually, hasn't he? Um, through online abuse, even death threats. No, no. It's ridiculous. Um, so I am looking forward to seeing him back. I've no doubt that he's learned a lot of lessons over the past nine months. And, um, well, he deserves a second chance, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, everybody deserves a second chance, don't they? Uh, anyway, there are, of course, plenty of other sprinters that will be looking to pick up stage wins. Caleb Ewan, for example, who's taken three stage wins in the past at the Giro for Lotto Soudal. Elia Viviani, who's won five, Although hasn't really been at that level for a while now. Fernando Gaviria, also a five-time stage winner, but again, not been looking at his best. And then we've got the Italian champion Giacomo Nizzolo, also European champion, of course, who still hasn't won a Grand Tour stage, despite taking the points jersey on two separate occasions in yeah. Italia. One key fast man we haven't mentioned, though. Remco Evenepoel. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> gotta let that one go now. Tim Merlier. The Alps and Fenix rider was unstoppable in his early season one day sprinters classics, and his teammate Van der Poel has described him as the fastest man in Belgium. Yeah. Well, I reckon that was just a pee off Wow, Van Aert, <laughs> personally. Yes, yeah. I would agree, though. In fact, I'd be surprised if he came away from those three weeks without a stage win because he's class and very, very fast, isn't he? Yeah, right. In the time trials, watch out for... Remco Avenepoel! Ah, that joke has gone on so long. It's almost getting funny, Dan. <laughs> uh, but true, uh, I was going to say Filippo Ganna, uh, although he's been beaten twice. Well, three times now, isn't it? After Sunday in the Tour de Romandie. Of course. Yeah. 
Yeah, what's going on there? Well, he's beaten there by Remy Cavagna, so he could start out as one of the favourites, couldn't he, for the opening uh, time trial here at the Giro? Indeed, yeah, at Almeida as well. Uh, Victor Campanarts, Will Barter, Nelson Oliveira, Alex Dowsett and Jan Tratnik as well. Uh, they're all up there. Yep, and then for the breakaways, Thomas de Ghent. Yeah. <laughs> I was not expecting you to say that. No, I was going to say Remco Evenepoel, but you told me the joke was getting old. So. Oh, no, I told you it was starting to get funny. Oh. Never mind. Um, yes, he will be looking to add the uh, stage win that he picked up at this race nine years ago. Was it nine years ago? On the Stelvio, ago? yeah. Blimey. And he, he finished on the final podium. I was just saying, he nearly won, didn't he? Yeah. Bonkers. He put them under some strain, the GC riders that day. And then just finally, for those of you in Australia, Canada and the USA who want to cheer for your home riders, the provisional start list has eight Australians on it. Stora, Scotson, Hindley, Hamilton, Schultz, uh, Ewan, Mayer and Hepburn. Uh, five Americans, Barter, Dombrowski, Jorgensen, Warbass and Van Garderen. And then just one Canadian, Antoine Duchesne of Astana Premier Tech. So watch out for them as you're watching on GCN Plus, hopefully. Right, Dan. I think it's time to name favourites for the win. Remco Evenepoel! <laughs> well, we're back on. Uh, no, I'm not going to go for him. I wouldn't mind seeing him win. I'm yeah, to say, that would I, be great. I mean, that would be, that would be next level even for him. It would. No, I'm going to go with my heart on this one. My prediction for the Giro d'Italia 2021 is Mikel Lander. I'd just love to see him win a Grand Tour in his career. I would. That's it, yeah. Bold shout, bold shout. Uh, right, I am going to go for Simon Yates. Yeah, it's another one, another heart one. That mm. one, although Head says that as well. More just to get that monkey off his back. The the 2018 explosion to end all explosions. And he's such a nice chap as well. Yeah, I'd like to see him do it. I think until he wins the Giro d'Italia, every time he competes there, we're always going to talk about 2018. Aren't we? Or even if he wins it like three times, it'll still be that <laughs> 2018. 2018. Yeah. Uh, well, as ever, we're now going to get the thoughts of a few of our other presenters on who's going to win this year's race. Hi guys, uh, my favorite for uh, Giro d'Italia is uh, it's hard to say. Yeah? Simon Yates. My favorite for the Giro is uh, Renko Evenpool. He hasn't raced uh, since uh, August, but uh, he has too much talent for not to be considered. Hi everybody, currently out on my lunch ride, testing the legs for the Giro d'Italia. They are not ready yet, I have to say, but I think who is ready is Simon Yates after an incredible performance at the Tour of the Alp, uh, Alps. I pick him as the winner of the Giro d'Italia 2021. For the Giro d'Italia, I go with Renko Evenpool. Simon Yates. My predictions for the 2021 Giro d'Italia is Alexander Vlasov for Astana. My prediction to take the GC for this year's Giro d'Italia is going to be the Brit Hugh Carthy of EF Education Nippo. I mean, he proved his climbing ability and his time trial ability at last year's Welta. So fingers crossed for the Giro this year. I'm going to go Simon Yates. Bang. He's going to do it. I can't believe Giorgio and Oscar are also in on the Evenepoel thing. I didn't say anything to them. Did They've literally just chosen Remco Evenepoel to win the Giro d'Italia, his first Grand Tour, without any other racing for months. Wow. Oh, I do hope he does it. I do <laughs> hope he does it. Um, as ever, we'd love to know your thoughts as well. So let us know one favourite, and also we'll give you an outsider for the win as well. well we didn't year. get an outsider, did we? No, we didn't. Too many presenters these days, that's the problem. Well, we went with Evenepoel anyway, didn't you? Yeah, he's my outsider. Can he have a, even a pause as an outsider? Anyway, just before we finish, one last reminder to join us for ad-free live and on-demand coverage over on GCN+. Plus. I know we're banging on, but this is a really big deal for us, and to have such a big race in so many places around the world is just fantastic for us, and hopefully for you as well. We'd love your feedback on everything we do. Let us know, in fact, anything we could do better, because we want to make this the best experience possible for all bike racing fans the world over. And I know we don't have this in every single territory, but hopefully we can rectify that in the future. Indeed, and we can't do it without your support as well. Yeah. So we will see you on Saturday. Oh yes. See you then. <laughs>